Um, the first thing that we can notice from the perspective of comparative planetology is just comparing these outer planets in our solar system to the inner planets. The outer planets are giants compared to any of our terrestrial worlds so far. So that's something that we want to explore is what, it, what is it that allowed them to grow so large? All right. So our plan for tackling the Jovians, we're going to do it inside out. So we'll start with their cores, um, the ice and metal surrounding those cores. We'll talk about their atmospheres, their magnetic fields, and then finally their seasons. So the key characteristics of Jovian planets, well, in comparison to the terrestrial worlds, what do you know about the Jovians? Yeah, so the mass of the Jovians is a lot larger, uh, but the density is, is smaller. So they are not uh, mostly made of rock and metal like the terrestrial worlds. And if we investigate their densities more specifically, I'll just call your attention to this third row here, their densities are fairly low. So in the terrestrial worlds, we were looking at about three to five grams per cubic centimeter. And now here, these are all around one uh, gram per cubic centimeter. Water has a density of exactly one gram per cubic centimeter. So Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune are all a little bit more dense than water, but Saturn is actually less dense, which means that if we could somehow submerge it, it would float. Um, I'll, we'll talk about all the other values in this table as we go through the lecture. So don't worry about them all now, but they're all here at the top of the slide deck for your reference later. Okay, so where does this density come from, right? Um, what constitutes the different uh, materials within these worlds? Well, at their, at their very interior is a rocky core. So by rocky, I don't mean that it's necessarily a solid object, um, but it's made of rock-like materials, silicates, um, carbons, and other heavy elements that are um, pressed down in their core. So um, your book shows this kind of ice cream cone type thing for each of the Jovians, and that is supposed to represent um, how far out does each layer extend in terms of radius? So all of the numbers here are in thousands of kilometers. So Jupiter's core extends from its center 7,000 kilometers out. Um, Saturn's core has a radius of 8,000 kilometers. So does Uranus's and then Neptune's 10,000 kilometers. If we compare Earth to all of these, um, the radius of Earth is about 6,000 kilometers. So it's not so different as a rocky body than the rest of the cores of the Jovian worlds. Um, this is the entire Earth though. So to be very clear, there's almost nothing else on top of this um, other than our very thin atmosphere. So here's Earth for comparison. Um, you can see that it's almost as if you could fit a little earth inside of each of these worlds. Um, here is what size each of the planets would be if we scaled them to the size of their rocky core. So based on this, if we calculate the volumes of each of these bits of rock based on its, their radii, then what we have to do is cube the radius as volume scales as radius cubed. And so if we did this and we estimate the um, volume of each of these, this would be in billions of cubic kilometers, then we can see how much bigger are all of these compared to Earth. So if we do the calculations for each of these worlds, um, Jupiter is about 1.6 times the volume of Earth, Neptune about 4.6 times, and then Saturn and Uranus both 2.4 times. All right, so based on what you've seen so far, what is the largest rocky object in our solar system? All right, yep, so it's the core of Neptune. Oops, sorry. The core of Neptune is the largest rocky object in the solar system. All of the cores of the gas giants are larger than the Earth. 
uh, which is in turn larger than any of the other terrestrial worlds. So that's kind of the order of size for rocky bodies. Okay, so um, that's all about the cores. Um, moving outward a layer, there is now ice and metal. So it's arranged a bit differently than the differentiation of the terrestrial worlds. Just on top of their rocky cores are layers of ice in each of the gas giants. So Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune all have ice layers. There's more ice uh, in proportion to its overall size in Uranus and Neptune compared with Saturn and Jupiter, which are fairly similarly scaled to one another. And then on top of those layers of ice, we have what is called metallic hydrogen. So this is um, hydrogen gas, um, but it acts like a metal. So I wanna talk about what does that mean? How does it act like a metal? Um, oops. Um, in case you're curious, the ice in question is not water ice. It is mostly methane and ammonia that has been solidified into an ice form. Um, but there is some water ice in there as well. So mostly methane and ammonia in the ice. Okay, back to this metallic hydrogen. So what is a metal? Um, in a metal, you have atomic nuclei that are arranged into a grid pattern. So it's a crystalline form of uh, the, the individual metals. So within this grid, electrons are free to move around in the spaces between atomic nuclei. And the fact that the electrons, which carry electric charge, are free to move is what makes metals good conductors of electricity. So I don't expect you to have ever heard of this before. Um, but in case you're curious why metals conduct, now you sort of know. So those electrons can flow within the metal grid. Um, sometimes the atomic nuclei are arranged in different patterns. So the different crystal patterns um, produce different um, conduction properties. And each atom has a different pattern based on um, the types of bonds that it can make with its neighbors. So it depends on the atomic number of the metals. Um, a brief bit of recall about what is hydrogen. What is in the nucleus of a hydrogen atom? So I'm seeing actually the most votes for one proton and one neutron, but actually hydrogen is just one proton by itself. So a hydrogen atom is made of one proton and one electron in orbit around the proton nucleus. And so since it's just one proton as the nucleus of hydrogen, then that means that metallic hydrogen is a lattice of just protons. And the electrons that would usually orbit the proton nucleus are now able to flow between the um, kind of grid structure of that metal. So now these electrons are free uh, to move, meaning that they are a good conductor of electricity. And that is exactly why we call this metallic hydrogen. So it's hydrogen gas that's been pressed together so hard that it organizes into a crystal structure and is now able to conduct electricity. 